Download and stay connected with the Changing Your World podcast with Creflo Dollar. Keep the Word of God at the forefront of your mind with these powerful and uplifting messages. Think how much more the blood of Christ cleans up our whole lives inside and out. With each message that you download and stream, you gain revelation of the fullness of God's grace. I'm talking about the grace of God that comes over your life, that makes living easy, that makes living sweatless, that the anointing begins to come up on you and there's not a fight, there's not a struggle. The Changing Your World podcast brings you life-changing wisdom right at your fingertips, no matter where you are. Subscribe today on Apple Podcast, Spotify, or your preferred podcast platform. Creflo Dollar Ministries TV app brings you live church services direct to your smart TV and much more. Don't miss a service and catch up on the latest messages from Creflo and Taffy Dollar like No More Worries, Overcoming Uncertainty, and countless other life-changing series streaming on the Creflo Dollar Ministries TV app. You'll also get access to Changing Your World Network, streaming grace messages and exclusive content 24 hours a day right in the app. The commandment is to honor our parents and to see them as valuable. We want to change our life. We have to start within. We have to start by how we're thinking in our innermost thoughts. Get unlimited streaming through Roku, Amazon, and Apple TV absolutely free. Visit your app store, search Creflo Dollar Ministries, and download the Creflo Dollar Ministries TV app now to start streaming. For more information, visit CreflodollarMinistries.org. God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, three yet one, truth and grace, power and sacrifice, love and peace. He is the creator of the universe, but I know him personally. Have you met him? He is vastly personal, a mysterious yet clear presence, bridge, a connection, the Holy Spirit, 
God himself. Through him, our insignificance is transformed by significant love. Have you seen him? He is invisibly present. His work is evident, palpable. He reaches into our mortal world and embraces us, changes us. Have you heard him? He speaks truth, an intimate tension between the spiritual and physical, connecting creation with creator. Do you know him? Simply profound, vastly personal, invisibly present. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. Let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition so you will not grow weary and lose heart.
seek you first and blessings have no choice but to follow us. Your goodness and mercy follow us always. Blessings. Declare over your life right now. Blessings. Declare over your life right now. Healing. Every time I turn around, blessings, 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 every 
say take the limits off. Take the limits off. Offer your prayers. Take the limits off. Offer your dreams. Thank you in advance. We declare your favor right now. We declare blessing over our lives right now. Before we see the manifestation, we declare it right now, Jesus. You're faithful to your word. We believe it. We plant ourselves by your living water, God. We believe it. Thank you for your strength, Lord. Move like never before, God. Hallelujah to your name, Jesus.
Hey there! Is today your first time here? Or maybe your first time in a while? If so, maybe you're wondering exactly who we are and what this church is all about. Well, we'd like you to know that we're a group of ordinary people who are on an amazing journey together, following Christ. Our guide is the Bible because it's the divinely inspired Word of God and it will never take us in the wrong direction. Along the way, we hope you'll see that we are welcoming and spiritually passionate and that getting to know you is a big deal to us. We know that the road is rough sometimes, but we'll work really hard to bring you practical and relevant messages to equip and encourage you through life's ups and downs. We want you to know that we care about this community, and we believe that it's our job to make it a better place. 
So no matter who you are or where you've been, we're glad you're here with us today. And we hope that you'll join us on our journey, following Christ and living out His plan for us. So welcome to church. Good evening, world changers. Welcome to Saturday Night Service. It's Pastor Wes, as always, and I'm excited to bring you a new life-changing word that I pray blesses your life, that it's a timely word that gives you uh, practical steps and hope of how to just navigate life and experience God's best. I want to take a moment and welcome our partners, our E-Family. Uh, they're tuning in from all over the state. we got people in different countries tuning in. We're so glad to have you here tonight. To our beloved World Changers Church and New York family, thanks for joining tonight. If it's your first time visiting and joining us, man, I hope tonight's bless, uh, message blesses you, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to minister to you and speak into your life. Let's get right into this with communion. Communion is always about a time of remembering, and it's easy to go through the week and remember all the things we've gone through, all the negative things, uh, all the clutter that may be uh, dragging us down, and this is a moment to kind of let all that go, to give it all over to God and say, God, I remember your goodness, to take a moment and connect with that. Ultimate is, yes, we're going to talk about the body, we're going to talk about the blood, but it's more talking about the person. And that person is Jesus that demonstrated infinite goodness towards us, unconditional goodness towards us. So as you take the bread, and it can be whatever it is, chips, cracker, cookie, it doesn't have to be something specific, it's remembering. You remember Jesus' body was broken for us. And it says, by his stripes and, and, and wounds, he was, uh, we are healed. And we experience healing for a broken heart mind, physical body, wherever it may be, receive your healing now. You may have gone through some things, uh, some traumatizing things. God is in the business of healing and mending broken hearts. So as you take this, know ultimately what it is. There's healing between you and God, that the healing from feeling disconnected from God or feeling ashamed from God, Jesus remedied all of that. So know you're good between you and God. So as you take this, eat. So as you take the juice, it's, it reminds us of the blood of Jesus poured out freely for us. Why? So we are delivered from sin. We're delivered from self. We're delivered from shame. We're, we're de delivered from guilt, from condemnation. The fear of being separated from God. Not that God was ever in the business of separating from us. But Jesus bought us with a ransom. It talks about it. Bought us from the ransomed us from fear, from the enemy, from wickedness, from uh, our, our own self-destruction is what it always uh, did and brought us into the light of this grace and goodness. So as you take this, remember, you are the righteousness of God and you are loved by God and you can drink. All right. All right, let's pray and we'll get right into this message. So Heavenly Father, we come before you. We thank you for another opportunity to sit under your word, to receive from your spirit, to speak to our eyes, ears, and hearts, to minister life to us, to minister deliverance, to show us the wisdom of how to navigate things. Father, I pray more than ever, there is a, a unique and special way that you bring people to a renewed strength in you, a renewed hope in you, a renewed comfort in you that brings deliverance, that brings the courage they need to step forward and do everything that you have purposed them to do. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we've been on this series right now talk, talking about take courage. And it is to put us in a different mindset. We've had so much, what concerns me at times as a pastor, and um, is we've had so much fear shoved down our throats that it's so overwhelming at times that it that it's like why even try why even have hope why even push for something good and that's not the point it was there to it should have been there to make us aware of issues and problems we need to be active and proactive about seeing change to better a society better as humanity but it wasn't meant it shouldn't have been meant as a to just scare us out of any hope of any goodness of connecting with God and it's easy to drift away from depending on God in the face of these things, to depend on self, to depend on, as that's what fear brought, brings us back to, that self-reliance part is what it is. But it's depending on God. So let's get into this recap. Let's get rolling here. Um, we talked about courage, the definition of courage, and I want to reinsert this every time so people kind of connect and then can follow because it may be your first time coming into this message, first time coming into this series, and I want you to be able to connect with what we're talking about. Excuse me, talking about. So courage, the ability to do something that frightens one or the ability to take action in the face of opposing fear is what I like to say. 
The other thing is strength in the face of pain or grief. The other thing, the statement, take courage, it means said to give support, confidence, or hope to someone. And this is why we take courage in God, that we get our courage from Him, that because of God, we have courage poured into us to make the changes, to make the adjustments, to face the difficult things, to, to face ourselves, to grow as individuals, to love people unconditionally, even in the face of, of, of foolishness at times, to take on natural steps and challenges that maybe, um, maybe we're trying to take on a new task is what it is, or, or a new objective that may seem overwhelming. Man, we want to have courage in the face of that, and the source of our courage is God at the end of the day. The source of our courage, I remind myself, the source of courage is not my own strength and my own effort. Apart from God, I'm going to bang up against something at some point that's going to be bigger than me. My courage is, is not in, my, my ultimate courage is not in a government, even though I believe we should be actively involved and that plays a role, but my ultimate source is not there. My ultimate source is not finances, it's not money, it's not you know, how good the economy is or how perfect the world is running or what everybody else in society is doing. My ultimate courage and my strength for every day is God. And His supernatural ability and love for me is what it is. And that's where I put my hope in ultimately at the end of every day. So let's recap. Let's go to, um, let's see, get over to my Scripture. Let's go to uh, Hebrews. Let's start in chapter 2 and verse 1. It says, so we must listen very carefully to the truth we have heard, or we may drift away from it. What does that mean? A little more, very carefully. It means continuously keeping it in front of our eyes. Taking another perspective. It's like the truth. Well, we know the truth is Jesus ultimately. But it's one thing just to flippantly throw that out and say, well, I got that. Part of this is a maintenance series. We have drifted away from living courageously by faith in God. We've drifted away and started letting fear creep in. And it's easy to do. I've done it. I do it sometimes. And I have to catch myself. It has to be a daily thing where I'm giving attention to the truth. Where I'm giving attention to God. Where I'm giving attention to His Word. Where I'm giving attention to things that promote faith. That promote courage. That promote hope. That promote goodness. What are you letting captivate you daily? You have to be intentional. You have to be deliberate. You have to be, excuse me, strategic and consistent about it. And sometimes it's looking back at the, some of the same things like we're repeating each week and gaining a new perspective. Where we thought we had it figured out and then we looked at it a little different and we learned something new from it and we grow from it is what it is. I want to be courageous. I remember the Scriptures where God told Joshua, be strong and courageous. But that means, and it talks about meditating on His Word. Well, our Word, we're meditating on the living Word, which is Jesus. And as I meditate on Jesus and God's goodness is what that is, it starts affecting me. It starts giving me hope. It starts giving me encouragement. It starts moving me toward the right direction. When I, give, when I give my attention to the Spirit of God writing things on my heart daily, it provides courage. It provides inspiration. It provides wisdom and direction each day. But it's taking that time to give it. So that's why I'm intentional when we say, well, what are we drifting away from? Well, you start back in, in, in verse 1 of Hebrews chapter 1. So let's back up and recap there. So it says, Long ago, God spoke many times in many ways to our ancestors through the prophets. Old Testament is talking about here. Two, and now, in these final days, God has spoken to us through His Son. God promised everything to the Son as an inheritance, and through the Son, He created the universe. The Son radiates God's own glory and expresses the very character of God, and He sustains everything by the mighty power of His command. Why do we insert that? Well, if you're going to get your courage, you think, well, you think, Joshua, well, I meditate on the Word day and night. Well, back then, all they had was some of Moses' writing back then. That was about it. They didn't have all the Word, all the New Testament, all the old prophets, because that was always what Jesus was trying to do. He's trying to say, well, I know what you say. I know what, what you quote from your Word, but I say. And so when we see something to get to know God, how do we connect with God? Because at the end of the day, all this was supposed to bring us to getting to know God. I pose these two questions each and every time. Can you trust someone you know? Of course. 
But if you don't know Him, it's hard to trust Him. Can you depend on someone you know? Well, it's getting to know God. But if you only get to know God through the Old Testament and the prophets, and you let that be the final word, you're going to live in this veiled understanding of God. You're going to live with the God of condition, the God of wrath, the God of judgment, the God of all those things. Well, isn't that who God is? No, actually. Just to be quite honest. Well, it's written there. Well, Job also wrote, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. But we know that's not right. He wrote that out of his anguish when he was in the midst of his trial and tribulation and trouble and confusion. He thought, well, is God doing this or not? And so we let our final deciding point to be what is really God. When we see two conflicting sides of God, what is the one that says is the true living God? Instead of a bipolar God, by the way, a back and forth God. You know, we look at Jesus as what we do. And when the prophets don't line up with what we see in the Gospels of who Jesus is and it violates the very nature and love of God, we say, you know what? They were operating in a veiled understanding. And Jesus is the ultimate connecting point to understand God's character, which is love. Now, why do we do that? Why is it so important? Well, we go to our next Scripture, which is found in 1 John 4. And we'll start in verse 16. We know how much God loves us. And we have put our trust in His love. See, that's where the courage comes from. Can you have courage that God genuinely, genuinely loves me? Let me start again. And we know how much God loves us, and we have put our trust in His love. God is love. And all who live in love live in God, and God lives in them. And as we live in God, our love grows more perfect. And so we might... So we will not be afraid of the day of judgment, but we can face Him with confidence because we live like Jesus here in this world. Such love has no fear. If you want to live free from fear, this is how. Because perfect love expels all fear. If we are afraid, it is for fear of punishment and our torment. And this shows that we have not fully experienced God's perfect love. So you're seeing the whole connecting here. Why is it important to know God's character? Because God is love. And when we live in love, we can live above fear. Are you tired of fear running the show? Are you tired of the torment running the show? Are you tired of not going about your day-to-day life because you're afraid to go outside your door? You're afraid to get on a train station. You're afraid to come to church. You're afraid to go see your family and friends. You're afraid to see your kids to school. You're afraid to let your spouse go to work. You're afraid to try again. You're afraid to try for that promotion. You're afraid to try and take a risk and, and, and do that. Are you going to let the panic and fear run the show? Is that what determines your decision making? And it does in all of us. It's just growing out of it. But what happens? What's the anchor that holds us beyond all the natural hope? It's trusting in God. So that brings us hope, just in reinserting, reinforcing the Scripture. Galatians 5.6 from the New King James Version says, For in Christ, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything, but faith working through love. Do you want to live strong and courageous in faith? Man, you got to believe God loves you. And so each time, what have we been doing? We've been going through the Gospels to see the character of Jesus. Not to maybe center up on one thing, but to catch the essence in the heartbeat of God. And every time we see Jesus stepping in, I care about you. I care about what humanity is going through. I care about humanity's suffering. I step in when there's trouble. I step in when there's sickness and disease. I step in when there's death. Because it's easy to look at all the brokenness and sickness in the world and say God doesn't care. And part of that, I believe, though, is let us not become complacent as a church that faith is denial or faith says we just kick back and we do nothing. Remember, courage is faith in action. That's why I'm using the word courage. There's some things in this world that God is waiting for us to step up. To see God's will carried out on the earth, we have to do certain things. To see certain things change in the world, we have to have the courage to say, I'm going to do what it takes to see change. And there's people that are thinking, well, things will never change. Well, if we don't step up, some things will not change. God's not going to just sit there and say, you know, why, let us sit there and be like, well, you know, it'll just magically change. I'm not promoting that. I hope you haven't heard that through the series that I'm being um, insensitive to that part either. Where people are like, well, we got to do something. You're right. That's part of what courage is. 
Courage is a letting, this, this part about, man, God loves me so much, i got to do something. It puts in action. So if we want to see a better world, we do have to be involved in things. We do have to speak up about things. We do have to engage in certain actions. We do have to demonstrate something different. But at the same time, on the internal world, you know, I've been talking about all these past few months leading up to this throughout this year, you know, Matthew 5, 8. You can see God in your outside world when we get our inside world set right. So it's also at the same time, simultaneously, why I'm encouraging that courage needs to do an outward demonstration. It's also about living in peace inwardly instead of tormenting. Because when you get the inside world set right, it's going to lead to good action. It doesn't lead to complacency. Living in courage does not leave in complacency or cowardice or checking out or any of those things. It leads into taking a bold stance, not in ignorance, by the way, or not in this religion weaponized version of God that we see where it's like, we're called to action, so you know what? Let's pick up our pitchforks. I'm from the South and I'm adding my little Southern twain, so I'm you know, speaking my own sphere. We're going to pick up our pitchforks and go on this foolish rampage for God. I'm not talking about crazy fundamentalism fundamentalism also. We're not doing any of that because it's always going to lead to love. It shouldn't create more us versus them. But there is certain things where, man, we've got to start stop allowing this fear to run us so much that it infects all of our decisions and our interactions from day to day. So what are we building up to? Let's go to Matthew 6 now. Let's talk about this different area. And what do I mean by why am I going to touch now another sense there? Last week we talked a little bit about our kids, our, our close family, our loved ones, our spouses, our parents, those people that are near and dear to our heart. Because why? That's a really sensitive area. We can experience a lot of fear. And you're like, man, you've talked about this before. Yes, that's why sort of things we drift away from. For me to talk about things we drift away, it doesn't mean I need to talk about something new. It means I need to remind us. This is a maintenance series. This is a go back and make sure we are doing what we know to do. They're like, well, I've been listening about hearing by faith. I don't care. Are you doing it today? Because you will drift. In the religious cliches of saying, man, I, I trust God I do this. Is it shown in your actions though? Can you really do it in your day-to-day -day life? That's what we want to do. We want to challenge, and I got to challenge myself. We're all challenging. We're examining the inside to make sure we're still staying lined up with things. All right. So Matthew 6, and the reason I'm going to start on this one, it's easy to worry about our day-to-day -day needs. Man, it's easy to worry about when you hear about a, a, a baby formula shortage. And I, I don't want to be like, well, that's not a real thing. It's affecting some of my immediate family members about that. that well, well, that concerns me. But it's also seeking the wisdom of how to do things. There's, there's so many shortages in our city right now. We're still in dealing with the financial aftermath of the pandemic. We're still dealing with the fact that, you know, we had to shut the city down and keep people safe for a little while. And it did hurt people in their jobs and things, and people are still trying to cover. And I know people directly, this severely affected. And it's like, man, and of course, you know, as society, as a city, we got to do things. We got to, you know, we got to be involved with things with the mayor, with the governor, and, and influencing, you know, how do we get back and how do we build ourselves back up as an economy? How do we create good jobs? I think all that is. And I don't want to hear about your political mess about this politicians. It's always a cheap shot to blame the president of any party. It's a lot bigger than that. But I, I, I'm saying, okay, now is the fear of not having, the fear of lack running the show. And that's what I want to center up on today. You can use all the circumstances because, you know, 10 years from now, it's going to be a whole new set of circumstances, a whole new politician to blame, a whole new stupid cycle. And we have to get off that. And it's saying, okay, am I going to trust God no matter what comes? Famine, no famine. Depression, no pressure. Recession, no recession. Whatever it may be, red or blue in the house or whatever we eventually switch over to, eventually that comes over time. Who knows in 10 years or so. I cannot let that change my mood and change my attitude 
where literally whatever is in the bank account, if the money's high, I'm on a high. If the money's low, I'm on a low. If one day maybe I'm living off steak and living off ramen noodles. Paul talked about this in Philippians. I have learned to be content in all seasons. Well, how did he learn to be content? He took courage and trust in God to see him through whether it's the high or the low. There's been times in my life the rent didn't show up one month. I had to go back and make it up. There were times in my life the lights did get cut off. I had to trust God to get them turned back on. But it worked out. It may have been really uncomfortable. It may have been stressful. It may have been a, a brief period of, of short-term suffering. But it's saying, can I trust God for the wisdom? Because here's the thing. that The other reason why you get in this fear and this panic mode, you do dumb things. You make irrational decisions. And many a times what I'm trying to separate also, and I don't think I even realized going through this series till now, we, we got this place. It's trying to sep separate the difference in courage in action and fear in action. Because fear will drive you to action. And it'll mimic courage. But we don't want to be operating off that type of the war, off a um, fear-based wisdom. It'll mimic wisdom. It'll mimic the goodness of God. It'll mimic a lot of things is what it will do, is my point. We're going to be operating off real courage and we're depending and we're anchored on God. Just because you see a lot of movement and people doing a lot of things doesn't mean it's productive. Fear will keep you moving all the time. But it's the hamster wheel. Courage will keep you productive. And there is a difference in that. So when we go over to Matthew 5, 6, it's Jesus talking here again, looking at the character of God, that Jesus actually cares. So let's get into this. Let's start in verse... I'm going to start in verse 24 and read through verse 34. Verse 24 says, No one can serve two masters, for you will hate one and love the other. You will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and in the love of money, is what I say. We all need money. Money ain't evil. I see money do a lot of good things. Money has bought health. They're like, sometimes money can't buy happiness. Actually, it can in some regards. It just doesn't buy the, the superficial happiness. I get the statement behind it, but it's like, yeah, it can buy some stuff. Trust me, you go on a family vacation, it bought some happiness. You go to the doctor and you're able to pay for the bills for your medical, you bought some happiness right there because my health is there. So it's like, ah, I'm kind of where I don't agree with that statement as much anymore. But what it's talking about when it's the driving love of money and people that don't have money can love money. People that have lots of money can love money. It's a heart condition we're dealing with. Hopefully all, that's also what you're hearing here. I'm talking about a mindset and a heart condition through this. This can't be just summed up in one action or defined in one situation. We're talking about a lifestyle, a perception of how we approach life and how we filter things. I hope you heard last week when I was talking about some sensitive matters with the school. I'm talking about a heartbeat. I'm talking about a, a, a perception. I'm talking about a, um, how we filter things in each and every situation. So it says, because you, you, you're going to be serving one or the other. When you're in fear, you're always going to be making the bad decisions. When you're chasing after money, when things are short, you're going to live in fear and you're going to do fear-based things. And it's not being complacent during shortage. No, nah, man. I th you know, all this stuff, I'm, I'm not saying we don't need action in. But let's talk about a heart condition. Because here's the thing. You can have plenty of money in the bank and still live in fear because you're fear of losing it. So what I'm saying is no matter what the condition is, you can still live in this place of fear. Oh, I don't have enough. I need more. I need more. And there's never enough. Okay. Verse 25. That is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life. Not to worry. But it didn't say be active. It didn't say go to work and man, we got to go to have a job. It didn't say do proactive things and responsible things. It said worry. Worry is a mindset. Imagine, you're going into work every day, doing your best effort, being the best employee you possibly can, but you're doing it all from a place of worrying. Well, I'm doing this just because I don't want to get fired. I don't want to get fired. I don't want to get fired. That's not, that's not the mindset. 
Is something wrong with the job? No, something's wrong with your mindset towards your job. Don't do things out of fear is my point. Do things from a place of courage. Make your decisions. And it's not always the decisions will change. It's how you do them. I, I say this many a times in life. This is something God has really just continuously always grown me in. He said, you know, God challenged me, and I've shared this many times before, but I see the need to share it again. God would always say, Wes, if I tell you to do something, and you do it, you go about it in all the wrong ways, does it make it right? I was like, well, no, even though you did what God told you to do. It's like I realized there were things in my life I would do what God asked me to do. I would do make the right decision, but I would go about it in all the wrong ways. I would go about it in all the wrong attitudes. I would go about it in, in all the wrong ways. Man, I, 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 you know, I challenge myself, even as a husband. It's like, man, I, I've done things for my wife. Like, I have cleaned the house before. Like, spotless. She's at work all day. I have the day off, particularly that day. I took extra time, or I got off earlier that day, and I was working from home. I, man, cleaned up the kitchen, did the vacuuming, took out the trash, washed the dishes, you know, did some extra stuff, and even cooked dinner. And didn't have the result I wanted at the end of the day. I was like, and I was so mad. I was like, you don't appreciate nothing I do. I sit there. I did my job today. I did all this stuff. Took all the responsibility. All you had to do is go home and go to work. Well, I started realizing what was the problem. I was doing the right thing. My attitude sucked. Forgive the straightness. My attitude wasn't when she came home patient. So I didn't express it. That's where Paul pointed out the real thing. about God loves a cheerful giver. Whatever you do, do it with the right attitude and the right heart. And I had to change my attitude. Because I, I, so what would happen? I kept, well, let me work harder. Maybe she'll appreciate it. Let me work harder. She'll appreciate it. Maybe, oh, let me work harder. And I kept doing it, but my attitude didn't change when I did it. I did it from a place of frustration. I did it from a place of self centeredness. You know, oh, I want to be seen as the good husband. See, look at what I do. Look at that attitude. It stinks. Or what can I get from her? Or maybe she'll, you know, let me do it so I can get my appreciation. And the attitude is wrong. And she saw right through it. And that was my fault. And when my attitude changed, and then I went back and did the stuff. This is why I talk about the analogy. Do the right thing, but do it the wrong way. It's still wrong. But when my attitude adjusted, the response was different. Because my demeanor and my tone and the way I handled it was different. It's things you got to learn. So in all these things, that's what I, I, I said all that. I was like, why'd you go all the way around? Hopefully, maybe, maybe a little marriage advice there. But is just because you did the right thing, you did it wrong, people, that ain't what you're supposed to be doing. So what a, my point was, sorry, nail the point. The point was, is every bit of this I'm talking about, it's a heart, it's changing your attitude. Fear will warp your attitude. But courage, that, that comes from a different attitude when you do things. We want our attitude to be different after the end of this series. We want us to calibrate our attitude is what we want to do. So, let me pick back up in verse 25. That is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life. Whether you have enough food and drink or enough clothes to wear. Isn't life more than food and your body more than clothing? Look at the birds. They don't, and, and right here we're saying, think about this. New York City. Look at the pigeons. Have you ever really truly seen a bunch of scrawny thin p pigeons? I say this to people. Oh, those, those, you know, flying rats of the air as they call them, those are some fat birds. Every time you see a pigeon, they got that, they're looking good. They don't have jobs. Some people walk and feed the pigeons, but they never seem to go without. So put that in your head for a moment. God will take care of the flying rats of the air. Never going to look at the pigeons the same, are you? Um, this is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life, whether you have enough food and drink or enough clothes to wear. Isn't life more than food and body more than the clothing? Look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or stew, store foods in barns. For your heavenly Father feeds them. 
And aren't you far more valuable to Him than they are? Can all your worries add a single moment to your life? It's talking about you sitting there worried about it. Sometimes you just need to accept the fact, I got, I got what I need for the day. I'm living in prosperity. Because there is people in this world that are struggling to even make sure they have what they need for the day. It's putting things back in perspective reality. Hey, you know what? i got enough to get back and forth on the train today. Tomorrow's a new day. I'll have to trust God with tomorrow. Why? Because the worrying about it doesn't add one thing to your life. It doesn't make your life any better. It is unproductive is my point. That's why you're like, oh, you're being insensitive towards some of this stuff. No, I just recognize I've done it long enough in my life myself. It never made my life better. It never caused me to have more food on the table. It never put more money in my bank account. It never made my marriage better. It never made my kids better. It never improved my life once. It actually did the opposite. It stole and it took. Because one, I wasn't present in those moments. I wasn't present to give my best in that moment where it could count and it could change. But why? Because my mind was somewhere else worrying about the future. I dream about the future. I hope for a better future. I plan for a better future. But I constantly have to remind myself, I am not going to worry about tomorrow. That takes courage. So verse 27, let me read again. Can all your worries add a single moment to your life? And why worry about your clothing? Look at the lilies of the field and how they grow. They don't work or make their clothing. Yet Solomon in all his glory was not dressed as beautiful as they are. And if God cares so wonderfully about wildflowers that are here today and thrown in the fire tomorrow, He will certainly care for you. Why do you have so little faith? So don't worry about these things. Saying, what will I eat? Now, um, let me pause right here. Verse 31, I'll pick it back up. It says, in the King James New King, take no thought. See, we're talking about once again, it's the mindset. You're like you're being super repetitive, Pastor West. That's intentional. It's intentional. I'm not here to blow past. I'm here to recalibrate. Why? Because I want I can want a different culture in our church. We can't just say we live by faith. We have to walk in it now. We have to take courage and act on this. We have to make this a part of something we truly believe. I get we went through a lot. But we cannot get stuck there. It's like, you have to understand, when we went through this pandemic and we're dealing with after thoughts in life, listen, we, we're going to be like the children of Israel that died in the desert if we don't move forward. Remember I told you, that the last year in our anniversary, it's about moving forward together. And sometimes moving forward together means me saying some things that almost hurt your feelings because they challenge you. And make you feel uncomfortable sometimes. This message is meant to do that. But it's also meant to help you grow, to help you heal. Because you cannot get stuck. And people are stuck right now. People are at home stuck right now. Stuck in their fears. And it's shaking to say, we have to move forward. Because this is unhealthy to stay in this spot and to live here. That is not God's best. That is not God's will. It happened. We cannot change it, but we can change how we move forward. We do get to decide not what we went through, but what we go through today and tomorrow and the next day and what we have for our future. So take no thought. Because you're going to sit there and you're going, to be, you're going to be going through your day and you're going to be like, oh my God, the pressure of... Especially when you first start trying to do this. Why? Because you've been trained to dance to the tune of fear. And fear plays on the areas of these are your greatest fears. These are core human needs. Everybody needs food. Everybody needs clothing. Everybody needs these things. It's when you worry about them is the problem. That's the problem with it. But if you program yourself to worry about it daily, it's running your life more than you realize. It's causing more fights in your marriage than you realize. It's causing more stress towards your kids to be unable to enjoy them growing up than you realize. It's taking you out of the moments of being present to enjoy God's goodness in the little things. So it's shaking. Let's start back in verse 31. It says, So don't worry about the things 
saying, what will, what will we eat? What will we drink? And you may not be saying them out loud, but you're saying them in your head. What will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers or people that don't know how to trust God. But your Heavenly Father already knows, already cares. The character of God, by the way, back to the love of God that we depend on, knows all your needs. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously and He will give you everything you need. So don't worry about tomorrow for tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. Be present in today. Learn to reprogram your mind in these things. And re-examine yourself. You're going to find yourself drifting. And I'll start worrying about this. I'll start worrying about it. It's easy. But give it over to God. And at some point we have to say, it takes courage. It takes courage to do this. It takes courage for me to go through my day and act as if I don't have needs. It takes courage to go through my day and make it about somebody else. See, the final thing I'll leave you with, it's like, how do I get out of this, Wes? What is the, really th the, the final piece of really getting out? What does the courage do? i got to go help somebody else. I see someone else with need that I have the ability to help even though i got my need. And it's not, you know, seed time harvest. I know there's a lot of other teaching like that. But what it does, it gets you off yourself. Because the part that this fear wants to drag you into is I got to worry about me. I got to take care of me. And what engages is self centeredness. See, the other side, I've been using the casual word of fear instead of courage. But you know what happens when you walk in fear instead of courage? You become self centered. See, that's what I've been trying to put out the undertone right here. Every bit of this leads you to self centeredness. And you make life all about you. And when you get in self-centeredness, here's what flows from that. Bitterness. Wrath. Envy. Jealousy. All those lists you think of things. You, you'll start mistreating everybody. You'll live a lifestyle of unforgiveness. You will live miserable on the, on, the, on the other side. This is bigger than just let me prove I'm courageous and I have a faith like some ego flex. No, the gateway that happens here... The only reason this fear ignites in you and leads you away from courage is self-preservation kicks in. See, when you deny self-preservation, and I mean selfishness, self-centeredness, making everything about you, always wanting your way, and, it's, and people think, oh, well, I only want my way. You know, I don't want my way. I'm not being, you know, trying to just take advantage of people or this and that, or maybe it's so intentional and malicious. Sometimes having your way is just simply because you enter that place of so much fear. See, self-preservation, it's all of us can kick in. Self-preservation can be sometimes, well, I just don't want to experience rejection from people. I just don't want to be emotionally hurt from people. So I'm going to do defense mechanisms to keep myself in that self-preservation. Well, that's not courage. It takes courage to step outside your self-centeredness. It takes courage to get out of self-preservation. And these are gateways. That's why I said this is a mindset. These are gateways the love of money creeps in. The love of money exploits self-preservation and self-centeredness. That's why there's certain things, and this is going to be a little maybe triggering to say, as much as I appreciate what our city is doing to try to keep us safe, many times we don't realize amping up... Uh, amping up all those protection systems and militarizing a lot of things to say we need to add this security, add this security, add this security to crack down on violence. That's a part of it. But when that's the only emphasis, you miss what's really going on. The real reason why in the pandemic we've seen so much increase and like, you know, when you pay attention to the crimes that are going on, it's like they're robbing a, a local pharmacy that's got supplies in it. They're robbing a local grocery store. They're doing this. And yeah, there's parts of it where it's like, oh, well, this person, they're just doing that so they can sell it at a higher price. They're doing it. Yeah, I get some of that. Some of it's just senseless violence. I'm not denoting that. But I do see the greater majority is, why is there so much pressure to do that foolishness? Because people are trying to survive. When 
resources, it shows time and time again, when resources get so scarce, so limited, people will kick into self-preservation mode. And self-preservation mode, you know, we read it through the Bible. There were stories, man. People started literally, you know, so the village survived cooking up their own kids. Good moms. These weren't villains or murderers or some kind of crazy, you know, psychopath, serial killer thing that we see on a Netflix show. These were people that were like, I have no, I see no other way out. So my only way out is to resort to these methods. That's what this stuff starts entering into. And so, yes, as a city, I hope we recognize the other side of it. We've got to provide, we've got to work towards more resources. When people's needs are met and they are trusting and they're out of that place of fear and self-preservation, you're going to see a drop in these things. It won't fix it all because that's not the only issue out there. But it will answer and remedy a lot of other areas. So my point, why, why are you saying that too? I'm trying to really hammer out the point. If we're not going to walk in courage, we're going to live in fear. And that's going to lead us to self-preservation. And life can't be all about you. You're going to be miserable. The reason you're experiencing that pain, you're so afraid to go out, the, out of your house, but you're, you're suffering, you're dying from depression and loneliness. Because I'm, that, that's what fear leads you to. I've got I to gotta protect me, I've got to protect me. But at the same time, at the same time, you're killing yourself. All those things going on. So I, I think I've hit that point enough to get you to realize, listen, there's so much more to trust in God and depending on God to, to get out of the mindset and to get out of that habit of let me walk in fear, let me walk in self-centeredness to courage, to walk in love, to walk in depending on God, to walk in faith on God because it will elevate you to a better life. It will actually bring you out of some of those things that you have been grappling with, you have been battling, and you have, uh, you have been suffering under. It's going to take courage because the other thing is, it's going to flow from that is hope. Hope. My, my last thing I want to say and leave you with this is there is a better tomorrow. But sometimes it takes making that first step out there to realize there is a better tomorrow. It won't be instant. There will be no waving a wand and magically everything is. There's more than likely not going to be some $20,000 check that's going to show up in your mail magically out of nowhere. I'm not promising any of those little cheap shot schemes out there. But I'm promising the change can start today. And as you continue to repeat, repeat, repeat that change, you are over time going to see things get better. Slowly. First, it just may be as simple as, you know, I just feel a little better today. Maybe my attitude's a little better today. But eventually it's going to translate into my life around me is better. But it takes courage to do that. So step out. Walk in that courage. And trust God loves you enough to show you how to do it, to lead you in wisdom, because you got this. And you can do it. You may feel like you can't, but you can do it. Step out. Even when you're afraid. Even when you don't think it's right. Step out and do it. And I promise you're going to be better for it. Hope you got something out of that tonight. Uh, I want to take a moment and switch over. If you have never made Jesus Lord of your life, if you have never invited God to come in, you're tired of running the show, you're exhausted, you feel miserable, then you need God in your life. It does take a higher power to to insert into your life, to change this inside world so you don't have to live in misery all the time. So you can thrive. So you can grow. It takes the practical work. It takes the natural steps. But without God, it, it just it's limited. It's capped. So if you, never, you have never done that, repeat this prayer after me. Jesus, I make You Lord of my life. I invite You into my world to rearrange things, to heal me, to give me peace and serenity, and to grow me, and to change my world around me. I receive your love, and I receive your goodness.
Amen. If you prayed that prayer for the first time, here's what I'd like you to do. I'd like you to text the keyword, I'm saved, to 51555. That's I'm saved, all one word, to 51555. We want to exchange some information from you, give you a chance to opportunity to download a free ebook, but we celebrate your life. We say congratulations in your decision. Uh, we hope you continue to engage with us and continue to connect with us to continue to grow. If this church and this message tonight bless you, hey, keep connecting. Hope you feel comfortable enough. Come on out to in-person service. We want to engage with you. There is a church community here that will love on you. We're not perfect. There is nobody perfect. But man, we are committed. We are committed to grow in God and we're committed to grow in how we treat people and grow together to be just better as human beings and be the best version of ourselves to create a better world around us. So we celebrate you. Those in the chat make them feel welcome, loved, and appreciated. All right, the other thing I want to do is I want to give you the opportunity to give. If you, um, first of all, sorry, if you see the lower thirds information, just pay attention to that. Uh, make sure your information matches. You know, we've updated things at the beginning of the year uh, is what we did. So just make sure you got the right information. But here's what I want to exhort you to do. Do whatever God puts on your heart. Remember I talked about earlier in this message about how I treated my wife from a different attitude. You know, I did all those things. I did all those great things around the house, but it was my attitude that offset all those things. That's the same thing with giving. Whatever you may give, it's from the attitude. It's not based in an amount. It's not about trying to do something to get God to do something because we're giving off what God has already blessed us. And then out of an overflow of compassion, a heart and love to pay it forward now to somebody else, to help someone else who may be suffering, to ease their suffering, that's why we give. So this church can continue to get this message out and support our local community and our members and to show God's goodness. So whatever God has put on your heart, do just that and trust that is enough. Once again, the information's on the lower third, QR code, text to give, P.O. box to mail things to, our mobile to give app, uh, our mobile app, you can give through that. Whatever God does, trust that is enough. And we thank you for participating and be a part of our church family to continue to grow and show God's goodness to people because we couldn't do it without you. So let's pray over those offerings. Heavenly Father, present these gifts of honor from a place of a good attitude. Our attitude is, is not out of fear. Our attitude is not out, oh, God, I have to do this. Our attitude is not trying to get you to move. Our attitude is just saying, we are grateful for how good you are. Now we're going to show it to others. And that's what we do. So we submit this to you with the wisdom, thanking you it goes forth to the right people at the right time in the right place to maximize its impact to show goodness to people in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. All right, everybody, a few quick announcements and then I'll be right back and I'll pray us out. Welcome back, everybody. Let's pray and we'll dismiss. So Heavenly Father, I speak over everyone under the sound of my voice. Here in this tonight, in this moment, or here in this five years from now, whichever it is, these words still hold true. I declare blessings over their lives. I declare that their supernatural needs are met. 
that they are well taken care of in every way, Father. That they don't have to worry, spend a day worrying about how to survive, how to make it to the next day. Father, You show them the wisdom of how to receive the goodness, to receive the wealth they need, to receive the need, but also trust and confidence that you know, we know You take care of us, Father. I plead the blood of Jesus to everyone for safety, for protection, and for peace in their homes and breakthroughs in their life and favor like never before. And we give You honor for Your goodness that You continue to display to us. In Jesus' name, Amen. Alright everybody, have a great night. I'm a world